In this episode, I interviewed Johnny, who is an MBA candidate in his second year at a top business school. Johnny has experience with case interviews and some offers on the table, but some that are still eluding him. So we work through the process of a very non-traditional case. This case had some COVID specifics in it, so it's quite updated, but it also required complete out of the box thinking and a requirement to maintain structure while being creative. It's a great learning experience for those of you that might be worried about finding a case that doesn't fit traditional frameworks. And it's an opportunity for you to work along as you practice your own creativity. Enjoy the case. I'll get started by introducing our guest today, and then after that, I'll introduce the case that we're going to do. Our guest today is a MBA student graduating in 2021, uh, and I think that his introduction will be uh, forewarned by the outfit that he's wearing today, so I'll I'll let him share a little bit about his bio in a second. Um, But at the MBA level in second year, right now, where we are is, is, you know, go time, right? Um, So I'm going to give a second round case that is creative of the likes that you would get at a firm like BCG, KPMG, Deloitte. um, And you'll see kind of where the theme of this goes as we weave it in. So I'm excited to have our guest introduce himself and then to dive into the case. Johnny, welcome. And why don't you give us just a little bit of your bio, how you've gone through the casing process, where you are in the process right now, and what in particular you're looking forward to today. Sure. Thank you so much, Jenny Ray. So I have a pretty non-traditional background. I actually started out in medical school and then I became a tech consultant. And then I started a startup company before uh, going to McCombs for my MBA. So very non-traditional. And if anything, I hope that I'm a testament that anyone can become a consultant if they really you know, want to pursue that path. And uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying my second year and I'm currently in the interview pipeline, I you know have everything from first round to second round to offer. So just kind of in different spots with different firms right now. Awesome. And then yeah. today in particular, any special requests, things that you want me to look for or provide specific tactical advice at the end of the case on? Um, I guess I would just love to just hear your expert thoughts on uh, what I can work on, because I think one of the tricky things about when you case with only peers or upperclassmen is that you might all have the same feedback all the time and not notice certain nuances that everyone could be missing, just certain blind spots. So I'd love to know what those are. Okay, great. Find the blind spots. That's the challenge. Good. Well, I don't know if you've seen one of our live calls before, but I'm going to walk you through um, the full case. I won't stop you. I'll just kind of let let you go through. But I do have a total time limit, which is 40 minutes. So our goal is to finish in under 40 minutes. Uh, If we finish at the 40 minute mark, I'll just kind of be like, okay, great. Thanks so much. And then we'll, you know, close it and wrap it up around 37, 38 minutes. I will keep a timer as we go through so that you um, at the end, We'll get feedback both on the content and also on the process that you went through, which includes the amount of time that it takes you to do. And that can be one of the things that sometimes people miss out on when you're casing with other people and they get used to the rhythm of what they've Mm -hmm. been used to. And uh, then finally, um, I'm looking for this case to be interviewee led. Uh, So again, the position that I'm taking is one at a firm where I'm basically just going to give you the prompt and then let you guide me through the case. So it's up to you to find the treasures. Okay. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get started. Awesome. So today's case is a uh, a fun one, and I decided that I wanted to localize it for you. So the case is called the Texas Unemployment Bump, and I'll read you out the intro right now. So our client is the great state of Texas, the only state in the U.S. that has its own state-shaped waffle makers. Texas is the second largest state in the U.S. by population at 29 million residents in 2019. Moreover, despite the traditional high growth rates of job availability in Texas, the state did not escape the COVID effect on unemployment. After a peak of 13.5% unemployment, that was how many of the workforce filed for unemployment in April 2020, the rate remained still high in September 2020 at 8.5%. So with this, dare I say it, unprecedented spike in unemployment rates uh, has come a similar increase in unemployment insurance fraud, which occurs when people mislead or lie when filing a claim to ensure they have a higher level of benefits than they would otherwise be entitled to. 
The Texas Workforce Commission has hired us to look to reduce fraud instances and improve fraud capture. How would you think about it and what would you recommend? Okay, just getting down this last detail. Okay, so we're looking in my neck of the woods here. I'm gonna go ahead and replay what I heard just to make sure that I captured the important details. So our client is the state of Texas, um, more specifically the Texas Workforce Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, the state has 29 million residents. Uh, we have this situation where job availability, it peaked at 13, uh, unemployment peaked at 13.5% in April, and it still remains pretty high in September at 8.5%. And what this has led to is an increase in unemployment insurance fraud. Um, and this is unemployment insurance fraud is where folks are asking for higher benefits or claiming higher benefits than they're actually entitled to. And so our client has asked us to do two things, to reduce the number of fraud instances and also to increase the rate at which we identify fraud. Did I get all of that correctly? Yes. The only thing I just want to make sure I clarify is um, the percentage that you said that the September unemployment rate was. What did you say again? I just want to make sure that was right. 8.5? 8.5. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, yeah, this definitely sounds like something non-traditional. I'd love to ask some questions to orient myself and get some context here. Sounds good. Um, all right. So the first thing I'd like to know is uh, a little bit more about what unemployment insurance is and how it works. Um, you know, I can make a surface level guess that it's, you know, money paid out to folks who don't have a job. But I'd love to understand a little bit more about just how it works. Yeah. So unemployment insurance is the benefit that is received. Um, it's, it's kind of, you know, most insurance you pay for and then you receive the benefit as a claim. Um, and so mm -hmm. this is the same type of thing, except you personally aren't necessarily paying unemployment. It's your employer that's paying on your behalf. And so when someone gets unemployed, the benefits that they receive, the financial benefits, the checks that they get are the unemployment insurance claims. So the, mm -hmm. the claims go through to basically get you into the qualification process and then the insurance payouts are um, the ones that you would receive. Interesting. Okay, so my next question then is, uh, we, want, okay, we want to reduce fraud instances, increase fraud capture. My question is, how is that being done currently? So what systems are in place to capture fraud and prevent it? Yeah, we'll explore that, I think, a little bit more inside the case, but just what would you think about? What, 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 would, what would be the normal process that you would expect? So, yeah, this is really tricky. Some, some kind of due diligence would have to be involved. Um, I guess kind of tracing the paperwork trail can be one way in which you can prevent it as well as increase the capture. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure what else. And I think I'll have to dig into that later when I draw my structure. Sounds good. Mm. Cool. Okay. And uh, let's see. just want to check if there's anything else I want to ask before I go into my planning. Um, yeah, I guess if I could ask one more thing, uh, I'd like to know if there's any specific quantified objective we want to attach. So when we say increase fraud capture, do we want to attach a specific number to that? Um, what, what, what would you think it would be? I think if we could get it to the levels that it was pre-COVID, that would be nice. I, as I imagine that would be, you know, the normal, the norm. Makes sense. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we have this, you know, fraud capture percentage, which is a percentage of the claims that are fraudulent. Um, but we also obviously have this burden on the system that's augmented by the fact that our unemployment claims are also higher. Right. So the mm -hmm. the the compounding of the two of them is difficult. But the one that we have the most control over is reducing the fraud capture rates. OK. And do we have a specific number that we're trying to target? Yeah, we might go into it in the case, but I don't know okay. now for you. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, well, uh, if I could have a few moments, I'd love to just structure my thoughts. Sounds good. We'll be right back after this quick message. If you're thinking about breaking into consulting, Management Consulted has developed the world's best interview prep program, Black Belt. It gives you eight sessions with an expert coach, as well as tons of amazing digital resources. And the focus is tailored to your performance, not anyone else's, just yours, to help make sure that you have the best chance of success you can possibly have. Check it out, managementconsulted.com. Okay, 
So I have a bit of a, of a rough sketch of how I'm thinking about this. Uh, I think it's going to be need to be filled in a little bit later as I uncover more because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about how we would solve something like this. But to start off with, I'm kind of thinking about three broad categories of things I, I want to look at. Um, okay. The first is uh, what's going on on the side of people who commit fraud. And what I would love to know, uh, just as an example of data that might fall under this bucket, is um, can we segment out the type of fraud in terms of what happens most frequently, what happens to a medium level of frequency and low level of frequency? So uh, in, in short, uh, looking at people who commit fraud and whether we can segment it by frequency. The second- Johnny, can I ask you a question? Is mm -hmm. that segment the people or segment the fraud? I just want to the be frauds. really clear it. Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. The frauds. Okay. Um, the second question, or not a question, the, the second kind of domain I'd, I'd want to explore is our client's side of things. And when I think about uh, the client side of the problem, I think it comes down to financials, right? They're, they're losing money. And, and so uh, in this bucket, I would actually want to separate it by low, medium, high in terms of spend. So how much money is being lost to false claims and segmented out by, by the um, dollar amount per claim. Perhaps we can uncover some insights by, by separating um, by that. That, what kind, kind of, of insights? Fears. Uh, for instance, perhaps um, you know a certain county in Texas, uh, maybe like rural over urban, is committing more fraud in the higher dollar amounts versus the low. And if that's the case, then we should probably form our strategy around the rural areas. So, kind of just yeah, creating segments to see what patterns emerge. Okay. So th yeah, that's the uh, second domain, and then the, the last area I'd like to look at are solutions. And this is where I admittedly don't have anything populated yet. I, I'd want to fill that in as we kind of uncover more, because um, just off the, top, off the top of my head, I'm not really sure how insurance fraud is handled in the real world. So uh, I, I definitely want to keep that in mind, but at that moment, I don't have any specific details to put nest under that just yet. Awesome. Okay, great. And so um, do you think this is a fixable problem? That's a really good question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say yes, because I, I feel like there are a few problems that are truly unfixable. I'm just, you know, there's always a way. And so I, I yeah, I, I want to say it's fixable. All right. Well, where would you want to start? Hmm. So I guess reviewing my structure, even though I talked about the, um, the claimants side first, I think I'd actually want to examine the client's financials first. I think that makes more sense because that gives us a more direct look into how specifically they're hurting and where. So let me switch up the first and second buckets that I named and start with, with the client financials. So uh, yeah, I'd love to know if we have any data on um, where they're losing the most money in terms of fraud types. Yeah, so um, let's let's do a little bit of brainstorming here. What, what do you think the types of fraud would be? What would people lie about when going through the unemployment claims process? Hmm. So types of fraud. I suppose there are two broad categories that come to mind. They could lie about how long they've been unemployed and whether they've been unemployed. And the second category can include things like even naming a fake company or claiming to work, have worked somewhere where they never worked. So kind of making doing it like a quantity and quality kind of structure. Gotcha. So the date of unemployment, they're overstating, you're mm -hmm. saying. And then the other one is they're claiming to work somewhere that they didn't work. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And there was one other thing under there. Mm -hmm. Under the quality bucket? Uh, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't remember uh, what it was, though. What was like that? lying about what kind of employers and... Yeah, I'm not sure what specifically, but I think just the nature of their employment. Maybe maybe they didn't work full-time, but uh, they worked part-time for a temp job, and, and now they want to claim that they worked full-time to, to reap larger benefits. Okay. Mm. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about these because uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting. Um, how would you verify whether these things were true or not? 
You're the mm-hmm. Texas Workforce Commission, and you want to catch somebody. You want to do the fraud capture piece of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that where I would start if if I were enforcing this is to actually just contact the employers. That's probably the most direct and easiest route is can you confirm that so-and-so worked at this place in this role from January to March? Absolutely. And um, so doing that employer verification process, when would you do it? Hmm. Like chronologically, when when I would do it? Mm-hmm. I think I, like I basically would Basically walk say, me through the process of what you think happens to a claim um, let's see if there's any insights there. Mm. Oh, okay. So yeah, I guess a, a claim comes in and then at that point it would be reviewed. Mm, so I imagine it would take place pretty early in the process. I think it'd be one of the first things that I want to do to make sure, because otherwise you're just wasting all this time reviewing a, a, an application that's bogus. We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. Okay, so so the claim comes in. Walk me through all the steps. Okay, claim comes in, and whoever's reviewing it will just look at the application, look at how much it's asking for. And how and how, do, how do people is. send a claim? What do you think? Oh, uh, I either digitally or by mail. I don't know if phone is an option, but I think digital by mail would be the two dominant options. Okay. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Mm. Okay. So, so whether it arrives digitally or uh, on hard paper, the reviewer would kind of look at the, the big details, like the employment dates, the employer uh, dollar amounts. I don't, I don't know if, if, the, if the people who file the claim ask for a dollar amount or if that's something that the insurance company decides, but dollar amount if, if it's the, the former. It's usually a percentage that's set by the, you know, if it's running in an, in an unemployment system by the state, it's a percentage of your... Um, rate. So, you know, you get 70% of what your formal, former compensation was or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, so I, perhaps there's a box where the filer would input their claimed uh, income then. Okay. And, and so that would be another detail that would get, get reviewed. And then, so after all that is looked at, uh, I suppose, I suppose that a reviewer could do just uh, a sanity check before proceeding, just see if this kind of makes sense based on their experience. And then afterwards, go ahead and get in touch with that employer. And you're saying that that would be done manually? Hmm. Manually. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question too. Hmm. I guess if it's submitted electronically, it'd be easier to automate such a process. If it's submitted uh, via mail, it can still be automated, but you would have to have some some good technology in place to scan that information and enter it in. Um, But then when it comes to the step where you're actually contacting the employer, I imagine you have to have a human being doing that. Why? Yeah. Because, I mean, as an employer, I don't know that I would tr- be able like, trust giving secure information out to a, uh, an automated you know, voice call asking for private data about my employer. I mean, okay. Um, yeah. So what would you have done um, in an automated way? What would you have done by a person? Hmm. Sorry, could you clarify that question? Yeah. What would, you, what would you have done automated and what would you have done by a person? Oh, in this whole review process. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, if uh, to the extent that's possible, I would love to scan all the input data, like all the fields, and get that in our database in an automatic fashion. And then actually doing the human side of due diligence, reaching out to the employers that I would want to keep it human run. And then, oh, I guess I should, I should also, as I progress through the chronology of this process, once the review is done, you know, eventually someone will have to sign off on it if they're going to issue out the funds and definitely want a human there to, to double check things. You don't want to you know, sign off on all this money and have it done by a robot and there's no, no accountability if something goes wrong. 
how many claims do you think there were in April of 2020? Just run some quick math on me. Oh, okay. So you said earlier that unemployment was at 13.5% in April. And so I guess it would be a matter of trying to estimate what percent of unemployment um, reported is also, uh, also translates into insurance claims. I'm going to, I'm going to guess that it's something high because I don't see any reason to not seek seek free money. So I'm going to guess it's 80%. Even higher usually. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm. Okay. So 80% of that 13.5, uh, 10 times 8 is 80, 3 times 8 is 24. So probably about 10% of the population is filing these claims. Okay. Roughly. 10% of the population or 10% of the, is there a different? Oh, um, okay. So I guess I, I should, I should ask for clarification. When you said 13.5% were unemployed, is that of the population or of the workforce? That's of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. In that case, uh, I'll re refine my earlier comment and say 10% approximately of the workforce would have filed for this unemployment insurance. Yeah. How much do you think the workforce would be? Mm. Mm, okay. So we know that Texas population is 29 million residents. I'm going to assume that population, that, that age is evenly distributed in Texas. So there are as many 70-year-olds as 50-year-olds as 12-year-olds. So if I assume that, and if I assume that life expectancy is roughly 80 years, um, and there probably won't be people in the workforce below the age of 20 because they're all either children or mostly students, so it would probably be safe to rule those out. You probably rule out 70 to 80 because they're mostly retired. So if they're looking at just 20 to 60, and that would be, uh, let's see, 20, 30. That would, that would be five eighths of, of the population. So five eighths of 29 million residents, I'll round, round that to 30. So I'll multiply 30 by five first for 150, uh, divide that by eight is roughly one, uh, I can run that up a little bit more. So to 160, divide that by eight is a little under 20 million. Um, yeah, so so 20 million would be in the workforce. And then- that, No, that's well, overestimated. Why might it be overestimated? Mm. Mm, yeah, so this would be assume everyone in the, in those age demographics who are in the workforce, but not all of them are. There's all kinds of things like stay at home parents, folks who choose not to work. Uh, so maybe I might apply something like a 0.7 multiplier students? to that. <laughs> students, yeah, oh, like, like myself, like myself. Yeah, that's true. There are are folks who are in their twenties who are still in school. So. Um, yeah, I, I imagine what would a 0.7 multiplier be reasonable to kind of weed out those who are not part of the workforce? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a little bit lower than that. So um, it, it ends up being about 11 million um, of the 29 million in Texas are employed. Mm -hmm. Okay, are in the workforce. Okay, so and then 10% we earlier stated uh, would be unemployed and filing these claims. So 10% of that 11 million will be about 1.1 million. That's right. People. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, in fact, I do have a little bit of data for you. Okay. Um, you asked about the, um, the claimants. So there are about 1.2 million unemployed claimants right now in the state of Texas. Um, out of those claimants, the typical fraud rate is 9%. Of the fraud cases, you mentioned one type, which was, um, or one type that I would kind of associate from it. 29% um, misclassify the reason that they are unemployed. For example, they'll see that they were laid off, but in fact, they were fired, right? So the one is for hardship of the business, the other is for the hardship of the employee or the mm -hmm. you know, attitude of the employee or something related. But there are two other types of unemployment fraud that we haven't covered yet. Um, and so I want you to think about if you were running the Texas Workforce Commission, what would you want to put in place to ensure that this was not a system that people gamed or a system that was intentionally designed to 
support the truly unemployed, not the, for example, optionally unemployed or, or something else? What are, what are some of the things that you would put into place, some of the requirements or requests that you would um, add to the process? Hmm. So I guess I would, I would categorize uh, possible ways to pre prevent this into uh, the carrot and the stick, so reward and punishment. So on the uh, reward side, well, I guess the reward side is already there because if, if, they, if they file a claim, they get money. So maybe I'll look more on the punishment, the consequence side of things. And so when it comes to consequences, uh, perhaps there needs to be harsher penalties on, on fraudulent claims. Maybe that's part of the reason why so many folks are, are doing this and think they can get away with it is that there just aren't any tangible consequences. Awesome. Um, now that's answering a different question than the one that I asked, but I want you to hold on to that because I am going to oh, okay. ask that in a little bit. Um, the okay. question that I asked is what type of fraud people could be committing, which is oh, a different question. So one of the types of fraud is that they say something that is untrue about their, um, you know, ending of their former employment. Oh, got it. Got My it. question was, what, how, you know, what are some of the other ways that people could game the system and what kind of safeguards would you want to put into place if you're in the workforce commission? Got you. Okay. So other forms of fraud would, well, I guess re revisiting my original structure, um, I guess I would want to add duration of employment to that list. Okay. Okay. So we have... Expl explain though, but uh, there, there are two other things that are not related to your former employment is what I'm saying. Hmm. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, hmm. Would identity be one? I, I'm and where I'm thinking is do do spouses ever do anything tricky with claiming to be their spouse or claim or or like do family members ever claim to be their family members is identity that is this? one um so the the actual name that I have for the category that I've already given you is misclassifying the reason that they're unemployed so that would fall under there um any kind of identity theft including spousal identity theft mm. oh okay um hmm. Apart from reason, let me um, let me give you a hint. Yeah. Um, what about P the, you can commit fraud when you're getting unemployment, or you can commit fraud to not get off of unemployment. What are some of the reasons why people might extend unemployment, um, and and what are some of the loopholes that you would have to safeguard against um, people collecting unemployment past when it is due to them because something in their status changes? Okay, so if if they found work they would still be claiming and so that that would be another reason under this bucket right so usually full-time work would flag the system what kind of work wouldn't flag it oh like part-time work and temp work just any, anything that's not full-time basically exactly so one of the questions that you're asked as you continue to receive benefits is whether or not you have income um mm. and so under reporting side income is a portion of unemployment um, insurance fraud. And oh, um, that okay. underreporting side income is actually 40% of the, the fraud. Wow, that's pretty high. Okay. So we still have another kind. <laughs> so there's another requirement when you are um, collecting unemployment. Okay. So, and just, just a high level here. We're talking. We're trying to figure out reasons that people fi fi file fraudulently. Um, these are these are ways that they file ways. fraudulently, like the, oh, okay, the okay. actual tactics that they use to commit fraud. Oh, the tactics. Okay. Let's see. Could uh, I, I'm I'm kind of stuck here, so I'm just going to throw this out. Uh, double filing, maybe. I, I don't know. Just. Tell me what, where in, you're going with that. Mm -hmm. Could could someone just file more than once somehow? You know how like in this political climate, people are afraid of you know voter fraud with 
you know, double voting. I don't totally. know. Totally. Similar, similar <laughs> idea. Um, you you <laughs> could, here. but, but um, hopefully our systems would catch that. If it's as human as you say it is, it's possible that that could be an issue. But, um, but that would probably be more of an honest mistake. Like I haven't received my unemployment claim yet, so I file a second time. Um, not necessarily like a fraud attempt to try to duplicate. Um, so so I, I don't know that that's something that would necessarily be an, a, a common instance of fraud. Um, okay. there, so let me go back to the other question from before, which is you're the head of the Workforce Commission. You want to pay out as few claims as are possible. The ones that are legal are fine, but no other ones. Um, and so how do you phase people out of um, unemployment? How, uh, how as in like how do I... Can yeah, you, you want you know the... even if they collect early, you want to get them off of it as fast as you can. How do you how do you either encourage you know how do you encourage them to get off of the unemployment? Yeah, hmm. well, uh, frequent communication is that uh, is where I would start. So having an SMS system set up with reminders um, about what or, or reminders to update your information. Okay. Um, yeah. What else would you want to remind them about? What do you want them to do to get off of unemployment? Oh, right. Of course, you want them to find a job. So yeah. I suppose you could, yeah, send out, you know, regular uh, email blasts with job opportunities, try to connect them to to work. One of the, um, the so the remaining type of fraud, 31% of fraud instances are related to over-reporting job seeking. One of the requirements to maintain oh. unemployment insurance is that you have to demonstrate that you're actively looking for a job. Otherwise, you actually fall out of the numbers entirely. So if you no longer actively look, um, then, you know, if you decide, hey, I'm just going to stay at home with my children or I'm going to do something different than what I expected originally, then you no longer qualify for unemployment insurance. Mm. Okay, so I think we've got the numbers now. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you need to calculate fraud claim numbers for each suspected type of fraud? Okay, let's see. So I have the ways to commit fraud. You gave me a 9% fraud rate earlier. Can I apply that 9% to all three ways that we just talked about? That's fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't know enough to know if it's different uh, between them mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So we have the ways, the rate, the absolute number of claimants. Uh, I, I think an important piece I'd like to add to this puzzle is converting this into a dollar amount loss for our client so we can understand the real impact. And, and so do we have any financials to attach to this data? I do like that. We should do that. I don't have them. Um, and so you do not have to do that. You can just give me raw numbers here. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then I think I have enough information to calculate the total number of people committing I think you might be missing one piece of information. Oh, okay. Let's see. Claimants, ways, fraud rate. Would would approval rate be a factor in this? So 9% commit fraud, but we don't necessarily approve all 9% of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, the, we, this is actually, we assume that we do approve it um, and then we oh. discover it later. So you know, anything that we don't approve wouldn't be, um, w wouldn't be included necessarily, but I know what you mean. There are some that maybe like would be a part of that. Um, but usually again, we, we consider most of those not fraudulent solely. It would be like a paperwork issue. They, they forgot something. So, um, so we can just assume that out of the 1.2, the 9% is fraud and there's some other number that is just those that are in process. Okay. The 1.2 and... are the one that are, the ones that are drawing. Let's say that. And so I'm, I'm trying to find the number of people who commit fraud. Correct. But I'm missing a number. I guess, I guess that's where I'm stuck because I feel like I have enough information. But So I said that the typical fraud rate is 9%. Oh, okay. I, I guess I didn't catch that. So the, the current fraud rate must be different based on that little hint you just dropped. Yep. Um, so actually in the prompt of the case, I mentioned that in COVID, we've actually seen an increase in fraud. Um, and ah. so our COVID fraud rates have increased by 140%. Ooh, okay. Okay, interesting. All right, so I think I have everything now. I'm gonna go ahead and try to calculate this. All right, sounds good. Walk me through your numbers. Okay, so we have 1.2 million claimants. Mm, I think what I'd like to do first is actually convert convert the fraud rate into the current rate 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take this nine percent and do one hundred forty percent of it. Okay. Um, and so nine is very close to ten. So that would be like a, that would that would translate to a fraud rate of fourteen percent if it were ten. But because it's a little bit less than ten, I can call it roughly thirteen percent. So thirteen uh, percent would be the converted fraud rate for COVID times. Okay. All right, and then. What do I want to do next? I'm trying to think of whether I should do the ways with the 13% first. I think I'll apply that 13% first. So I'll take 13% of the 1.2 million claimants. So uh, let's see. This is kind of like multiplying 12 times 13. So uh, 12 times 12 is 144. And then we add a 13 to 12 is 156. So that is 156,000 people total are they are what they are committing committing this fraud in COVID times. So 136,000 people commit fraud. And then I'm gonna break that up into the ways in which they commit fraud. So first I'll take this 40% who don't report uh, their uh, new jobs or income. And so I'll pick 40 times the 156. Um, I think I'll just adjust this number to uh, 160,000 for now, and I can dial it down a little bit later. So if I treat it as a 160,000, then it's just a matter of multiplying 4 times 16, which is 64. So 40% of 160,000 is uh, 64,000 people. Okay. And then let's see. So 64,000 subtracted from the 160 is roughly 100,000 people. And because the other two remaining ways are an even split, almost 29% versus 31%, I'm gonna just divide this number by two to get 50,000 each. But I have to keep in mind that I rounded up a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna round down a little bit now. So I'm gonna say it's a little bit under 50%, maybe 48,000 people. Um, for the first reason and the, and the third reason that we're given. So. All right. So 48,000, 64,000, and 48,000 people for each of these three ways that we described. OK. What do you think about that? Yeah, this is uh, a lot of people. And I, you know, I think we definitely need to do something about this. Um, Again, my mind is still kind of on financials because I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, even though 48,000 people might um, commit one way of fraud versus 48,000 in another way, perhaps one way just generates a lot more loss because there's more dollars attached to it. So I, I'm still kind of curious about the financials if, if we have that. So since I don't have that, and I, I, again, I don't disagree that it would be good to have it. I just don't have it. Um, okay. I'm interested in trying to figure out which one of these you would target first. Which of the methods of fraud would you go after dealing with? Oh, okay. So what I would target first would be the most bang for my buck. What do I think will hit the most people and also be the most cost effective? So what would reach the most people would be that second bucket of folks who don't report their side income or don't report it when they get a new job. Um, now thinking about what is most cost effective, that would be what would probably require the least amount of labor slash effort to, to identify as fraud. So uh, if I can just take a moment, I'm gonna read through these, these ways one more time and just kind of okay. think about what might be cheapest to capture. Okay, so I would say that the first reason where they they can you know lie about, or sorry, not reason, the first way, method in which they can lie about the reason they're unemployed might be the most easy to to verify. Uh, and so, on the cost side of things, that would be the best choice. On the benefit side of things, the second option is the best choice because it has the most people. So I would try to get one of those two. Okay, sounds good. Well, then my final question is, um, one of the things that we're interested in exploring are ways not just to improve the capture, but ways to encourage people not to commit fraud in the first place. And so can you brainstorm with me some ideas that you would have about how you could, 
you know, trigger or encourage people not to commit fraud to reduce the overall fraud rates rates from the beginning. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if I can take a, a few moments, I'm just going to brainstorm a short list. Okay. So here's how I'm thinking about it. Uh, going back to the whole carrot stick framework. So on the reward side of things, perhaps there, we can create some kind of incentive for updating your status. Uh, as far as how to do that on a you know actual execution level, uh, it's something that I would have to think about for a bit. But just broadly speaking, create some kind of incentive for keeping your information up to date and accurate. And then on the stick what side kind? of things, be really specific here. I know you yeah, say you like, want to be specific later. I want them now. <laughs> yeah, fi fi financial incentives. I I, I just, what I what I just not, I'm not sure of is where we would get get the money or how we would justify that. I think we'd have to you know make it pretty pitch deck and make it pretty convincing. But yeah, if, if we can get our client to. So you're saying, you're saying basically we pay people more if they're honest. Yeah. So if 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 they've already been paid out some claim money, maybe we can add a small small percentage bonus if they do things like file on time or give, give information that we verify is correct. When just when as as early as possible because the earlier we do that, the sooner we stop paying them <laughs> claim money, claim money. So, yeah. So, but, really. but I guess what I'm trying to figure out is we're incentivizing them to tell the truth, but how are we telling that they're telling the truth and not telling a lie? Oh, got it. Okay. So I guess if we can tweak this. Like, what, like maybe... when, when do we pay them out? What are we sure that they told the truth? Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder whether we could incentivize their actual, methods rather than the outcomes. So the outcome is something that, as you mentioned, we can't necessarily verify. Like we can't verify whether or not uh, people make side income. So what if we instead incentivize the method of reporting? So if they give us hard proof that they're not making side income, but I don't know, it's tricky because how do you prove that something doesn't exist? It's, you know, like proving the negative is really tricky. And I, I think that why makes this problem difficult to solve. So. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I'd I like to move on to the to the stick bucket then, because I, I think I have some better incentives on, on okay, that side of things. Okay, sounds good. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when it comes to penalties, I'm kind of thinking about it in two ways. One is that we can increase the penalties, so make the consequences harsher. And, the, and two is we can uh, just increase the messaging, the marketing of existing penalties. So on in that first bucket, you know, whatever the penalty is, if there is one right now in place, let's let's make it a little bit harsher. You know, it's X dollars right now. Let's make it X plus Y dollars for for lying on a on a claim. Um, and and then on the marketing side, um, we we can include in those earlier email blasts or text message blasts that we talked about to kind of encourage people to update their info and to find a job. We could perhaps occasionally include a message as well about just warning against the the consequences of fraudulent claims. So incorporating that into our core marketing schema can can increase the, uh, the message reach and hopefully hopefully prevent people from wanting to commit fraud. Sounds great. Well, Johnny, we're out of time. So do you mind just closing up the case for us, telling us what we've discovered and identifying any next steps that you would like to take? Okay. Uh, can I take a few moments to gather my Just thoughts? dive right in, actually. Oh, dive right in? Okay, sure. We'll be right back after this quick break. If you're enjoying learning about strategy and want to put it into action, one of the best ways to do that is by joining us on a future Strategy Sprint. Strategy Sprint is a two-day training process, one day for skills and one day to plan with a team how to solve an actual case. Then we put you live with a client for an entire week with a coach that is a former McKinsey, Bain, or BCG staff member. Your coach will guide you through how to interact with a client, how to resolve data, and how to make great recommendations. Join us for the next strategy sprint by finding the link in the show notes and registering on our upcoming wait list. We look forward to having you. So uh, I'd like to recommend that we, we target um, folks who have lied about the reason they're unemployed and uh, folks who don't report new employment uh, as the uh, segments for, um, you know, who should we try to prevent uh, fraud coming from? And the reasoning being that this is where the most fraud is taking place. 
and also that this is where uh, I feel we have the most cost-effective ways, solutions in addressing fraud. Uh, as far as what those specific solutions uh, I recommend are, uh, one is to create incentive structures for folks who provide verifiable information that, um, you know, if they make it easier on, on our client to, to check, then we can give them a small reward for, for doing so. Um, the other is to, uh, on the penalty side of things, both increase the penalty for fraudulent claims, as well as increase the messaging um, of, uh, about the consequences of fraudulent claims. And by implementing all of this, uh, the ultimate outcome that we aim for is to reduce um, the, the instances of fraudulent claims and to prevent them from happening. Okay, awesome. Are you glad uh, to be done with that case? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> felt very out of, out of the water there. <laughs> it's a really hard question. And one yeah. that, you know, um, I, I wanted to write a case that I felt like was timely and appropriate, but also applying the, the, the frameworks and the skills that we think about in a very different environment. And I had a lot of fun doing the research for this as I discovered the archaic processes that a lot of organizations um, use. So um, Deloitte Consulting has actually done a case for New Mexico that they share about on their website, which might be interesting to read about. And they talk about mm. um, these kind of systems and processes, et cetera. So um, overall, Johnny, you know, you you prevailed. You got through the case. <laughs> you maintained a great attitude, um, a good focus. And I liked you a lot. And honestly, in a first round, I would have really felt like we we were going to get there. I felt like that you had all of the attitude and confidence, but there were some second round things that I felt like were gaps. And I want to point them out mm. so that if you're going into interviews or preparing for things specifically, I want to make sure that you know what those are. That You asked me for blind spots. I found a few. Um, great. First of all, in the uh, beginning, I just thought you nailed the initial recap. First of all, it was super clear. And also you demonstrated a real interest in the case and, and enthusiasm, even though I could feel you taking this very deep breath, like, oh gosh, what have I gotten myself <laughs> into? I volunteered for this. What the heck, right? Um, you know, so a minute and eight seconds um, for your initial recap, you did great for that. I think that some of your initial questions could have been more incisive. You took three minutes to ask me a couple of the questions um, about, you know, identifying what unemployment insur insurance is, um, what the current methods of fraud capture are, and then the measurement rates. And I, I like what you kind of did, but just should have done a little bit more aggressively and a little bit more punchily um, is you're, you're kind of like, here's what I might think it is, you know, but I don't want to take a stand. Like when you say this, yeah. here's what I think, just make it a little crisper in the delivery so that it's easier to respond to. Because what you were doing was inviting me into a conversation that I actually didn't necessarily want to have at that part of the case, but I felt beholden to do it because you were so nice about it. But it took us collectively longer to get through that than I thought it was worth for the value that it added to your structure. So mm -hmm. I would just ask those questions more directly in a more punchy way so that you get to them a little bit more clearly. When you came out of your structure, you gave me very little confidence that you had done a thorough structure by saying, I developed a rough sketch that I'm going to build on throughout the case. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't really care how crappy you think the structure is. First of all, you only took a minute and a half to build it. And so you could have taken longer to build a better structure. And if you haven't gone back recently to just put a timer on, I, my guess is that you might be abbreviating your structuring period a little too much and not giving yourself the amount of time that it would take. But as far as I could tell, you gave me two categories with one bullet point each inside them. Granted, the bullet points were valid and very good, but I would have definitely wanted more data, more data inside your bullet. So um, the commit fraud categories, right? You said the type of fraud by frequency, which is actually exactly what we ended up looking at inside the case. Um, but uh, but then, you know, um, some of the other things that we ended up doing, mapping out the claim process to try to understand where the greatest cost buckets are, the inefficiencies, where the most likely um, questions are, potentially the way that they're simply worded is inciting people to commit fraud, um, you know, what kind of 
Uh, what number of triggers are there toward honesty? There were just a lot of ways that you could have potentially gone into that. And I wouldn't have cared um, which ones you went to. I just would have wanted to see more in your initial category. And the same with the client. I felt like, you know, basically what you were saying is that we have this like volume issue and then we have a cost issue on the client side. We have to staff this up. So like, you know, in, in, in California, we have 22 people that process our claims. So if you apply the rates to Texas times another like 125% of the population, 22 people have been attempting to file and get through, you know, 1.5 million claims, right? That's just like a massive amount of information that an archaic system is broken and unable to handle. And mm -hmm. so some of that kind of very early insight around, you know, what are the number of claims that we're processing per week? What are the kinds of industries that we're processing claims for? You kind of went into some of the segmentation of the data, but I didn't feel like you had written it down clearly to the point where you were then reporting it back to me. So I just thought a lot more data and that part would have been great. And then I, I want to go through the, what I think the biggest takeaway for me was as we went through the case. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that they felt like you were unstructured, but I think that there is um, like you were very creative and very conversational, but I did feel like we lost structure as I kind of took you on this tangent and took you on that tangent and took you on this tangent. What I do not want is for you to anchor yourself back to your initial structure. What I do want is that you are mini structuring as you're going through it. And I actually couldn't see you writing notes. So this could be just simply an optics thing. You might just want to move your camera back a little bit so people could see it. I don't know if you were doing notes digitally or like on an um, electronic pad or doing them in some other way, but it felt like you weren't writing anything down and we we're oh. just kind of like <laughs> this over here and that over there. And then, so when I, you know, looked for, for example, the anchor back to the rates of increase in COVID, or we should think about punishment and incentives, um, I didn't feel like there were reference points that we could tie into as you were coming up with good ideas throughout the case. So can you just tell me a little bit about what you were doing from the note-taking side um, so that yeah. you can maybe help with that particularly? So I, I was just typing notes on my computer. Uh, I, I like to use uh, Excel during these virtual times because it, it, the cells create this natural division that, that helps me segment my thoughts. Um, you might want to at least announce that to your uh, to, to the folks that you're working with, but I wouldn't necessarily assume that they're going to be okay with it because I was kind of like, I feel like he's not writing anything down, which uh, so apparently <laughs> you weren't. Um, but I think that what writing would give you is a more fluid capture of some of the things that we um, were talking about. So as you are brainstorming, it's actually easier to write than it is to type. Like typing and writing at the same time is a little bit more tricky. So just separating out those two functions and writing it down might have been able to um, give you more capture. So maybe at the beginning, you do it that way, or maybe in the math, you do it that way. But, you know, if you're using Excel, I'm kind of like, wait, why are we doing estimation math? Um, although I'll talk about the math in just a second. I thought you did pretty well on that. Um, but yeah, I, I would just say that might be one of some, something that you want to run by people because it did seem like you weren't writing anything down. And I felt like you were maybe like, notepad sketching it or something. And so just letting them know that you are taking notes, but you're taking them digitally. Um, are they okay with you taking notes digitally? If they say no, you need to have practiced enough cases for um, to, to move over to a pen and paper. But it also just might be worth it to practice a couple of on pen and paper, because I did feel like when I came up with a couple of ideas, um, you like, except for the time that you asked for time, Every other thing that I wanted was that kind of structure, but you never gave it to me except for that one time when you asked for the time to do the creative structure. So in some of these cases where you're kind of brainstorming as we go, I would like for you to be capturing more um, in a structured way so that the brainstorming becomes a little bit more evident so that what we're missing maybe becomes a little bit more clear. Um, and so I would say that that was kind of one of my big takeaways. The same ended up being true actually in the final um, recap. It just came across as though the structure was like wide, but not deep. And that was just my general perspective was that you were like full of lots of wide ideas, but we weren't necessarily able to complete any of the full pictures of a lot of the other pieces. Um, and then uh, the final thing that I'll just talk about was the math overall. You did a really good job with that. Um, at, at the second level at the second round for an MBA, I would prefer for you to tell me insights before you do calcs. I think you could have said them here. So um, I think you could have, for example, um, either done a calculation or a quick, 
you know, in your head calculation of which of the segments was going to be the largest from the beginning and told Mm -hmm. me, like, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for the largest segment because that's probably going to be a good proxy without having the cost per claim or the cost per overrun for the ones that are, um, you know, likely fraud and what our savings could be. But also I would be interested in knowing which ones would be easiest to capture. And so I think if you had given me that right at the very beginning, um, that would have afforded you a little bit more leeway as you were going through the math to verify it. Or potentially in a second round, I would just be like, you don't even have to do the math, Johnny. That was exactly what I was looking for, um, which is a big win for you if you're able to get there. So um, other than that, I think that's my primary feedback. Overall, it took us the full 40 minutes to complete the case. Um, and and again, I think if you had been a little bit more clear about the note taking each time, I was asking you a kind of follow on creative question um, and we had kind of wrapped those up a little faster, I think we would have been able to move through the case a bit more um, quickly. So I really kind of let you have a ton of leeway in this case to see what you would do with it because that's one thing right now, more than ever I'm looking for as an interviewer, uh, you're going to be potentially sitting in your you know bedroom working for eight to 12 hours a day by yourself, maybe meeting with me once or meeting with the team once, but for the most part by yourself. And so I need to know with you having the, the um, completely way to do anything, what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Makes sense. So anyhow, yeah. Any, any questions for me about the feedback or about the case? Uh, yeah. Let me kind of go down the line as far as the feedback you gave. See if we have questions. Um, I, I think that what you said about taking the stand with the clarifying questions delivery is really good. Uh, I, I've been trying to work on hedging less when I when I case because communicating uncertainty is not what you want a client to yeah. receive. So, <laughs> I've got a rough yeah. sketch here. I've got I've got some ideas, but I'll fill it out as we go. Like, don't say that. Right. Here's here's yeah. what I came up with. Just own it a little bit more. Mm. For for the framework part, I, I do recognize that I had a very sparse framework. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my thinking was I, I recall reading somewhere it, it might have actually been one of your materials where you said how the, the longer you take the more is, is expected of your framework. Mm-hmm. And because I couldn't come up with anything, uh, I, I thought okay, I'm just I'm gonna just d- deliver what I have and hopefully get get some points back for doing it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of my thought process. But um, I you're you're totally right. I mean I I ideally would have liked to. Fill it in with more with more bullets per bucket. I just and after we worked through the yeah. case, go back now and rebuild it um, and see what other metrics you could think about. I think that in a government focused case or any organization, if you're if you can't figure out how to lean on the measurement of success figure out how to lean on what it costs them, right? So like if you can't figure Mm. out what the benefit is going to be, dive into how many staff members do we have? How many claims do we process? How long per claim does it take to process them? Like if you had given me only three bullet points per category, I would have felt like that was sufficient. So I I really do want to just encourage you that I was looking for a little bit more, but not necessarily any specific thing. I was just looking for more of that measurement inside your structure. Mm. Got you. Cool. A, another question I have is um, regarding your feedback about you know, creating mini structure during creative questions. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I, I thought that I did throughout the case, like whether it was saying quantity and quality for types of fraud or uh, carrot and stick for solutions. And yeah. so I, I'd be curious to know like what would be an example that perhaps I, 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 I missed where... So, so for example, yeah. um, and this I think has to tie back to the note taking question. So I asked you the types of fraud question, and then you said um, hey, there are two kinds. There's like a quality one, and then there's a how long one, and you kind of built them out. But there wasn't ever a time when you were like, so let me recap. I have two categories, and then on the one side, I have three things under the quality. I have whether or not they're unemployed, claiming to work somewhere that they didn't work or that they didn't work full time or part time. Part of it is that like um, you didn't pause to recap as you were pushing on to the next thing. So you kind of kept pushing, kept pushing, kept looking for the next thing. And I felt like there was no organization of what you had already done. So I would just Mm -hmm. maybe recommend that, you know, once you've gotten something down, say, okay, great. So here's where I am with my structure. And I know that there might be gaps, but let me just recap what I've done. I have three ways that people could create fraud through quality. And then I have one way that they create could create fraud through duration. And so, um, you know, I have these two categories and I walk through that. So like you were walking through it forward um, to the end verbally, but it all came across as one giant list rather than any kind of 
categories because you never recapped back for me. And, and I think that you, like, as you're going through it, you weren't like, here's the first thing, here's the second thing. So in a virtual environment, even if you were writing it down, I, you have to assume that I'm not capturing what you're writing down. So you're almost using that verbal time to go double check that I got the three things that you said versus just maybe maybe idea A and B blended together for me. So you're distinguishing between those by kind of going back and recapping and saying, hey, here's what I came up with. And I know that there might be something else. For sure, for sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I guess uh, one more kind of overarching question I'd like to ask. Um, I think a big piece of, of why I felt I was stumbling throughout the case was just uncertainty about how this industry and process work. I, I think even, even at this point, I'm still really unsure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I guess uh, a general question I have is when a candidate encounters a subject matter that's non-traditional, so they can't just draw, you know, like CCC P, P framework or something, um, how, how do they, what's like a, not a go-to framework, but a go-to way of thinking that they can kind of latch onto to kind of escape that in the moment panic of like, oh, I, I don't know what to do here because this is so unfamiliar. Yep. Um, I think there are three and it's worth it to do a case that's hard with all three to figure out maybe which one might be good for you. They okay. are actually standard frameworks. It's just applying them in a different way. So okay. the first one is the profit framework, like thinking through an organization like this and thinking, how do they make their revenue? Where does it come from? In this case, they come from employers. The employers are one of the stakeholders here, right? And we have an employer rate per employed employee. Um, and that number kind of, you know, comes back to the, the whole party, to the whole system. Um, um, and then um, the uh, volume. So we have the volume of, of the um, employed versus the volume of the unemployed, right? Um, and then the, and so like just in terms of getting ideas for metrics, and then the cost, right? We have a fixed cost to operate. So we have probably some salaried individuals and some maybe tech. Like what are we spending money on can kind of point to mm. some of the things that we're going to measure, right? Yeah. So using the standard profit framework, you're not necessarily, you're, you're going to rename it. You're going to say like volume of claims rather than volume of customers, right? right. Um, and mm -hmm. you're going to say, you know, staffing instead of fixed costs. But like you're, as you're thinking about just kind of the business model, I think that's really helpful. Um, I would also, by the way, put that up into the great um, clarifying questions to ask business model questions can be really good because if you instead of asking me like what is unemployment insurance and how does it work just like you know what does an unemployment insurance agency spend their money on here's what I would think like just get that out of the way in your clarifying time so that when you're going into your structure you can already have some of the numbers or some of the categories down essentially mm -hmm. um, the second one is just cost benefit which is basically the same thing but for more non-traditional cases can be better right what would be the cost of doing this of capturing fraud or somehow reducing the fraud through better verification or something else like what would be the cost how would we measure that how much more time would it take for example how many claims do we have to apply it to um, and then what would be the benefit of it what is the savings per claim that is not fraudulent um, for example and so um, again like applying those two things can help you come up with very case specific metrics and then I actually really do like the market study framework the the um, you know the customer company competitor and product framework because in this situation right who is our customer um, our customer is the unemployed um, who is our um, are, you know, who are our competitors, we have none. So we have complete control over the process. So just kind of, again, like using that to really quickly run through and identify what is our, what is the product that we're offering? Okay, we're offering an, an insurance and an insurance um, claim um, to people. So there's something that's desirable. There's a carrot there that they're interested in. And then what is the thing that we are, um, you know, how is, how are we operating? What are our, is our company? And again, so you're not going to use that as your framework that you necessarily call the buckets the same thing. But again, just using those same concepts, um, figuring out how do we measure each one of those things um, and then renaming them, I think could be effective in all those situations. So those, I would recommend just go, going back and trying one of those three. And in this case, feeling which one might have made more sense and then trying that in a future case. Thank you so much for joining this episode with Johnny. He did a great job maintaining some structure while I was trying to throw him off and move him in different directions. And there was still some room to grow. It's always exciting to figure out where you've got blind spots inside the case. 
If you're interested in helping us help you find your blind spots in the casing process to ensure that you don't have to fail an interview, go through a waiting process, and reapply at a time that might not be as opportune, please reach out to us, team at Management Consulted. In addition, if you'd like to be a live case partner for Zoom calls and on this podcast, we would love to have you. You can find that information in the show notes as well. And finally, if you liked this podcast, once you like it, review it, and share it, it would mean so much to us. We're grateful to have you along for the journey as we go through more companies and more cases at Strategy Simplified.